Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. Sometimes the reason you're cast is because there's something innately within you that you can bring to the role that people want to see. And so I think if you kind of let your instincts lead you, then that's also a really great place to go. So good of you to join us, listeners, for another episode of In the Envelope, your podcast for all things acting, Hollywood, navigating the industry, Outlander, and Belfast. Welcome if you are a fan of Outlander and our guest today, Katrina Balf, whose dulcet Irish tones you just heard. It was such a delight to speak to Katrina. We spoke over video. The wonders of Zoom, the wonders of doing press still amid an ongoing pandemic, But here we are, November 2021, uh, with the premiere of her new movie, Belfast, sort of looking like movies premieres are kind of getting back to normal. And so I'm excited for maybe someday soon an in-person podcast interview. Every single interview you've heard over the last year and a half, almost two years, listeners, has been over Zoom. Excited for that to be maybe in person again with COVID-compliant safety precautions. Anyway, Katrina Balf. What a fabulous interview. What a fabulous actress. Gorgeous, riveting. Uh, We got some real insights into her process here of creating characters, how personal it can get. And I will say, Katrina has an interesting trajectory through the industry as she started studying acting and wanted to be an actor, but then got sort of sidetracked through uh, about a decade of modeling. And as she says, that path turned out to be great (laughs) because Instead of getting into acting at an early age, she kind of cut her teeth doing something else and was able to attack acting in her late 20s. And look at the success where it's gotten her today. I mean, Outlander is just a huge hit. It continues to be a huge hit. The time-traveling romance drama that kind of took TV by storm really has for five seasons, and season six comes out in early 2022. And now Belfast, Katrina stars in... Writer-director Kenneth Branagh, who is a brilliant director, but who, of course, is also known for his screen work, um, he created this coming-of-age tale sort of based on his own childhood in Ireland uh, in the late 1960s, which is during the beginning of The Troubles, for those of you who know. I'm just going to give a little bit of background here because this Belfast film is, of course, about the escalating conflict between Protestants and Catholics, which was really the Unionists versus the Loyalists. Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. Um, and it ended up spanning decades and, and it, it affected so many families, including, you know, Sir Kenneth Branagh's, but also as Katrina Balfe reveals, her father was a guard sergeant. And so they were moved to the border. She said that she go she would go through the army checkpoints to go shopping across the border. So anyway, this film resonates on a really intimate, personal level. It's much more focused on this one particular family than the violence or the reasons behind that. Katrina and Jamie Dornan play Ma and Pa, while Judi Dench and Kieran Hines play the grandparents to a young character named Buddy, who's played by the delightful child actor Jude Hill. I should also note, this is a beautifully filmed black and white film with moments of vibrant color, though, and those moments are when the family is watching films or stage shows. So very much a testament to the power of escapism and entertainment, the kind of stuff we love to talk about on this podcast. Belfast is one of those movies that kind of reminds you why we love going to the movies. Um, One last thing I asked Katrina, and I think we will be asking guests going forward about IATSE, which is the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees Union, because a strike has been authorized. 
meaning local crew members and technicians could go on strike at any moment, shutting down film and TV. It's very relevant to Backstage readers. We have a lot of content about it on Backstage.com. They have, as of now, reached a tentative deal with AMPTP, which is the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, but it's an ongoing topic. And so I asked Katrina, and we'll be asking actors going forward about their perspective. Because this is an ongoing discussion around workplace conditions and hours and essential workers. And it's always helpful to ask, I think, especially established actors, you know, what individuals can do. Actors or artists or anyone in any role on on a set, what can they do to make a positive difference? Anyway, let's get to this fabulous interview with Katrina. Katrina, if you're listening, thank you so much for joining us. This podcast is, of course, brought to you, listeners, by Backstage. Listen, aside from all the great inspiration and tips and all of that stuff we offer for free, like this amazing podcast, Backstage also gives you access to incredible casting calls all over the world. That is why it's the world's number one casting platform. If you're curious or if you're an actor yourself and you really want to jumpstart your career and you're ready to take the advice and the inspiration you've heard here in this very episode and use it, go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code ENVELOPE. E-N-V-E-L-O-P-E. That's, again, 30 days completely free to try backstage where you can make a profile, upload a headshot, upload a reel, start browsing the casting notices, and start applying to jobs because who knows, maybe one day I'll be interviewing you. Again, that's backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code ENVELOPE. Once Katrina Balf made the leap from modeling to her original dream of acting, she began working in commercials, web series, and eventually on the big screen. Her breakout role as Claire on the Stars series Outlander, adapted from the hit Diana Gabaldown novels, has earned her awards in the US, UK, and her native Ireland. And she starred in H, Money Monster, Ford v Ferrari, and now Focus features Belfast from writer-director Kenneth Branagh. Here is the sensational Katrina Balf. Katrina, hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. It's, I'm so excited to talk to you, and it's it's really good to speak over video. That's I know. Nice. It's kind of, it's nice, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like the real thing, but not quite. Yeah. Where are you in the world? Uh, so I'm in London at the moment. Okay. Congratulations on the premiere yeah. of this film. It's so, it's again, so exciting that it's in person. And it's a real proper premiere that this film deserves. Yeah. I mean, it's it was so crazy. We went to, we had it at uh, London Film Festival um, last week. And it was my first time mm. being in a room with that many people. My first time seeing a film in like, in, in a cinema in 18 months or, or longer, like much oh, longer, amazing. I think. Um so it felt really special. Yeah, it was really cool. Slightly so, nerve-wracking, but also Oh, I'm cool. sure. I mean, that's so funny because the first movie theater movie in 18 months game for you is um, Belfast. <laughs> that's really wild. I know. It's, it's kind of crazy. Well, I can't wait to ask you all about this film. We are, we are backstage, and I know you've spoken to backstage before, actually, but it was a, it was a while ago now. And I want to ask you about Outlander too, but we're really, I'm really here to get all of your secret acting techniques and craft advice and all of that. You're making a face. <laughs> um, I'm just excited to, in, in the context of Outlander and Belfast, but um, take me back to the very beginning. What were the initial inspirations? Like why acting? It's the big question. Oh God. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's in you, right? Mm-hmm. I think it's something you're either cursed with, <laughs> you know, this need for attention and need to perform and all those things. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I suppose if you kind of want to analyze the whole thing, you know, I'm, I'm child number four of, of seven, eventually, you know, a big family. Um, there's probably something in that of a need to get my my voice heard and be seen. But also, I, I, you know, I do think you're born with, you know, you can see it when kids are young. There's some kids who are just it's in them, right, that that they want to perform and have the, that kind of thing. Sure. 
And I think probably it came in some way from my dad. My my dad was uh, a police sergeant, but he used to do a lot of comedy skits with, he had this group of friends and they used to write and perform these comedy skits. Really? Um, yeah, which is very strange because <laughs> if you know him, he's such a, like on one hand, he's very authoritative and, you know, very straight. And then he would do these crazy skits. So like, I remember watching some where, you know, my dad's 6'4", and he was like dressed in a wedding dress and stuff. And, oh, wow. you know, I think it's quite funny and silly, but um, yeah, I guess. So somewhere in all of that, I became an actor. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> And then you did go study it at, um, you studied drama at Dublin Institute of Technology, but did you complete that program? I did not. I okay. Failed. No, <laughs> I didn't fair. fail. I left. <laughs> right, right. Um, I, I took what I thought was going to be a year out and right. uh, I never went back. Sure. Very, very bold of me. Well, I suppose, yeah. And so is the trajectory that it was um, a few years of, of modeling all over the world, right? Yeah, so I started modeling in Dublin, but it ended up being a decade, really, I was doing wow. that. Um, mm -hmm. And sort of that was all over the world. But, you know, I do think, I think, you know, there's all of these great things that happen in your life that you don't really know why and when at the time. But mm -hmm. I definitely don't think I was mature enough or had enough of life experience to be an actor in my early 20s. I mean, I know sure. there's some people who can and do and do it amazingly. But for me, I just, I needed to live a bit more of a life and see some things. And, you know, I think when I finally came to it, I, it was the right time. That's such a great, yeah, it's actually, it helped you in the end that if you had dove into acting at age 18, I mean, of course, this path would not have been the same path, but I like the point that you yeah, might not I just, have been ready. Yeah, and I don't think I would have had the, I definitely wouldn't have been responsible enough. I think, you know, <laughs> there's things you can get away with as a model that you definitely can't as an actor. Um, just the responsibility of, you know, being on time, <laughs> um, the, the kind of the amount, the workload, you know, I don't think I was ready for all of that in my 20s. Interesting. And so how did it then drift back? Was it a conscious choice? I'm going to go back to my original love of acting. Yeah, no, for sure. I was, I, it was definitely always in the back of my head that mm -hmm. I would go back. Um, I just wasn't sure how it was going to happen. And I was living in New York and, you know, I'd started taking classes in New York um, at various different kind of like dropping classes and things like that. But you know, it just became more and more apparent that I was sort of miserable, you know, and I wasn't okay. doing what I wanted to be doing. And um, I think by the time I hit like 28, 29, it was like, OK, girl, you you have got like sort of one shot to mm. to either do something that you love or you're going to be miserable for the rest of your life. So you better make that decision. So. Well, when you put it that way, it sounds like an easy decision, but it's still a risk to go pursue the life of an actor, right? And you knew that. Oh, my God. I mean, I moved to L.A. at 29 to start acting when, you know, in in a lot of circles, people already tell you you're over the hill, you know, and you're too old. And I remember I have this really great friend. Uh, he, he's an agent. And I remember talking to him and he was kind of like, well, you know, it's it's hard out there for women and it's yeah. hard out there for women of your age. <laughs> I was, you know, so it was like, it was definitely a huge gamble. And, and I, I used to say, I, you know, I'm, I'm just going to live in this little bubble of delusion that it's going to work out because yeah. I didn't really have a plan B and, and it had to. <laughs> so luckily it did. I don't know. <laughs> well, that exactly, that exact description is like the key to a, a success in the, an acting career, a little bit of delusion and, and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> knowledge that a lot of hard work rejections and a lot of hard work. Yeah. yeah. A lot of and hard work, a lot of delusion and yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but are there concrete skills from modeling to acting? What is the overlap? If any, there's some in terms of, I think you, you get used to a certain amount of rejection 
<laughs> that okay. um, mm. that 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 has there's parallels in that. Um, but in terms of the process and and the actual acting, no, I think they're right. very like they're so different because one is all about this two D image and and con- like constantly being aware of how you're looking and how people are perceiving you. Whereas mm-hmm. I think that's a death knell for acting. You know, if yeah. you're thinking about how you're looking when you're acting, you're not feeling or in the, in the scene, you're just not doing that's the great. work you're supposed to be doing. So I think it, it was a lot of things I had to unlearn, you know, and it took me a yeah. while and I spent a lot of time in classes in LA and mm-hmm. um, there was definitely a process of, sort of stripping away bad habits and and learning how to <laughs> to actually yeah be in be in the scene with somebody and not not be worrying about what people were thinking yeah that's a great point there's there's unlearning as much as there is learning for any new mm-hmm. skill i guess um is it true i didn't know this that you were in the devil wears prada which i find fascinating because that almost is a bridge between modeling and acting <laughs> I think my feet were in the Devil Wears Prada. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, there was about, uh, yeah, I'm very uncredited. Um, <laughs> there was about four, of me and three friends of mine who were all models. We were all hired as like featured extras. Um, okay. and, and it was a way to get, I think, uh, get, you know, sort of get on the ladder to get in your SAG card. Yeah. Um, and I remember doing, one day where we sat in a, in honey wagons nearly all day and did nothing. And then I was supposed to do a second day. And then this other job came up and I was like, oh, I'm going to go do the job. So I think oh. I had done like one scene where I walked and maybe they got my feet, but uh, <laughs> I didn't stay. No. That's great. <laughs> and so in the emerging and all of these acting classes, you then did start to book roles. This was in L.A., right? Mm-hmm. Um did a technique start to emerge or a bunch of different techniques that that you still use? Are there things that you do to prepare for every role? You know, I think there was definitely, I think I, t- I took a little bit from everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I I studied with a few different people. There was Warner Laughlin was one of the first and she was great at building, a, you know, a memories of a character and going mm-hmm. back and sort of like finding the clues within a script that tell you something about the person and then working your way backwards and sort of building that up from childhood, which I find really interesting. And, you know, I still, I still use that quite often. And then I did Meisner for a long time, which is all about, you know, listening and, you know, being reacting and all of that. And I think that that's something that has always, you know, if if you're not listening in the scene and if you're not, taking your cues from what another person's doing, then you shouldn't be in it. Right. Um, and that was really helpful. And then Judith Weston was somebody I studied with quite a bit. And she was amazing because that sort of brought all of these things together. And then she would she would have you work with directors in her classes. And so it sort of was, you know, I think sometimes in acting classes, it's just a bunch of actors all yes. trying to do the same thing and you're all in the same place. But when she, But Judith actually brings it into a whole different space where it feels more like the job or something Mm -hmm. like that. And I mean, her classes were incredible. And I think that's probably where I learned to put all of the pieces of the things I'd been learning in other places together. That's so cool. Yeah. And then Outlander is an unusual example, I think, for, for, well, for acting. It's always interesting asking about long form acting, which a long running TV series is. But when you booked Claire, did you use all of those techniques to to kind of create her? And then is that just for the pilot? And because you're at that point, you're not thinking ahead. This will be six seasons more. Yeah. Um, you know, it's really interesting because I did not have a lot of time. I think I had <laughs> maybe a week before I was there. Is that a blessing and... or a curse? I think it's both. I think, you know, I think, I think you, you have to use whatever hand you're dealt right. And in the first place, but I found, I think for me, what I, what I try and do is find 
a book or literature or something that sort of gives me an in. You know, I love to read anyway. And, and that for Claire, I found a book that was firsthand accounts of nurses who mm. had gone through the Second World War. And, you know, when we first meet Claire, that's where she'd just come from. And that's where yeah. we meet her in the pilot. So, yeah, all of my so cool. research and work um, was sort of done for that. And because I, I think after that, you know, you sort of the scripts will inform where you're going to go. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there was a lot of cramming <laughs> for one week. And, you know, music as well. You know, I just took a lot of things from the 40s. I sort of was like, okay, what would she be listening to? What would she be watching? And what would she be reading? So um, cool. And sort of that's where I went. And yeah, it's it's wild to think back to that because it's so that long ago. Week. But yeah, that one, that one week of crazy cramming that I had. The cramming. But that's a great tip. I mean, it's it's just true. Actors who are new to that process might not know. Yeah, it's all about the hand you're dealt. And sometimes the hand you're dealt comes with limitations, which I suppose... But also then you. you end up using your instincts. And, and I, I think sometimes if you have too long to prepare, you overthink things. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes the reason you're cast is because there's something innately within you that you can bring to the role that that people want to see. Yeah. And so I think if if you kind of let your instincts lead you, then that's also a really great place to go. Is everything you just said true for auditions? Because auditions are all about various hands you are dealt. What is your approach to auditioning? Oh, auditioning is a tough one, isn't it? It depends. I mean, because again, you may be given a day yeah. or you might get a week. And also I think, again, you know, for me with auditions, it's first of all, get the text down so well that you don't even have to think twice about it Great. and then you can play. So, you know, I think you have to make some very quick decisions off of sometimes you don't even get the full script, right? So sometimes you just get the sides and mm. you're completely in the dark. Mm. So I think for me, I mean, it's been a while since I've sort of had to audition without the full script, but I think what I used to do is you try and, get as much facts as you can and you make quick decisions about, okay, well, she's saying this and she's doing this. So what would make a person be like that or whatever? Cool. So then you just have to bring as much of that into you and then see what comes out. I don't Very know, cool. yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, but learn your lines. I think that's the most important thing for any actor is be off, be so off book that when the casting director says that is so not the take. Can you do it from this point of view or that point of view? You're not thrown because you know the lines inside out. Right. And you're demonstrating like flexibility and versatility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's and great. I also never learn my lines out loud because I think then oh. you sort of get stuck into a way of saying them. Oh. I write my lines out always. And so... I, I might not, never, like when I'm saying them in the room, might be the first time I'm saying them because <laughs> I think then, yeah. Do you know, I, I remember watching, I, I think it was like uh, an actor's studio and I think it was Robert Downey Jr. who said that. And I was like, right, stealing that. <laughs> so yeah. I, I always, even to this day, whenever I have to learn lines, I write them out three times and I know them then immediately because there's something, there's something as you're writing them. I'm also thinking about different ways that it could be, said or done or it could mean something or and so it, it, there's a different place in your brain I think that it goes into totally and I they're locked in that's really fascinating because there are other actors who say the complete opposite where like you have to speak it as as much as you possibly can even recording it and playing it back to yourself you know oh, the wow. way that actors memorize lines is always so different it, it really must depend on everybody's brain it's, it's you know everybody it you, you find what works for you. Yeah. But that really works for me. Crazy. I don't know. And there's yeah. some trial and error early on, and now you kind of have it down, as with anything. I think when I was like in school, I remember doing school plays, and I used to record out other people's lines on a tape and then leave a gap for where mine were going to go. Cool. And then I would like learn it that way. But that's that's a long time ago. Sure. <laughs> but I guess the, the process has to keep evolving. Um, mm -hmm. Also, in terms of Outlander, uh, I wanted to ask about producing. Is producing mm -hmm. 
a totally different hat, like in the process of making this show, are you ever wearing both hats at the same time? Is there overlapping between starring on the show and producing it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think producing on the show is is one type. You know, I, we have such strong producers who are there. <laughs> there's there's not that much room for like us coming in and like doing loads. But definitely, you know, say if you're in a scene and usually as an actor, you're just thinking about yourself, your character, and that's it. But as a mm-hmm. producer, if you see things like there's another character and even, you know, my eye is always like if somebody's costume or hair or makeup or something is not working, mm-hmm. you know, that's a producer thing because ultimately the whole look of the show needs to work. Mm-hmm. You know, if there's stuff going on with the crew or if there's stuff that needs sorting out, you know, I, I like to be in that space. Mm-hmm. I like to sort of help get the whole show moving along and for everyone to be happy so that's a different part of it um and then also it's like script sort of work you know it's like early on you get earlier drafts and you're sort Uh of working the script and working the character that way so i and i love that stuff but yeah i i'm you know developing stuff as well um as a producer and that's sort of different to what I do on the show. And that's a really, sure. it's just really interesting. And, and I think it helps me as an actor, all of those things, because yeah. I think sometimes as actors, we can be too myopic and just only looking at our part in something, mm-hmm. but to be able to realize that, you know, it's not all about you. <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> decisions are made for various other reasons. I think it takes away some of the insecurities i guess because we can sometimes get insecure if if things change or you know if they need to move on or they've cut your scene or they've done things like that and generally Mm. it's because there's a financial reason or there's a scheduling reason or logistics or something and you know i think a lot of time on sets and in productions actors are the last people to know anything and i think it doesn't always help because then you're kind of like well why, you know, yeah. well, why, why are they not doing this? You know, is it, mm-hmm. is it because they don't like me? Is it because I did something yeah. wrong? Is it because, you know, mm-hmm. and I, you know, it's generally never that. So it's, it's, I always say it's like more information is helpful. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the actors, and I think as a the, producer, I try and do that. Yeah. Yeah. Actors are the authorities on their characters. And so I guess you as a producer are kind of advocating for that, not just for you and Claire, you playing Claire, but for like your co-stars, like you're saying. Yeah, no, for sure. And, you know, sometimes, you know, it's happened on the show where a character's, you know, their role will be cut, you know, certain Mm -hmm. things will be cut from what had originally been in scripts and they feel really bad about it. And they'll come to me and they'll be like, why did this happen? I mean, and, you know, Mm -hmm. I'll know from production meetings that it was literally about a location was lost or something else. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I, I'm able to say, look, it's absolutely not about you. Like, this is the real reason. But, you know, other people don't think to <laughs> to tell actors that, you know, they just sort of yeah. give them their days and that's it. So yeah. I think it's not all about you is actually great advice for actors. <laughs> right. Yes. I think it's it's really good advice for actors because also, you know, I know it's like sometimes you're doing a big scene and you're worried about whether you're hitting it or not. And like the crew and the director are just moving on and they're not giving you any feedback. And to be honest, it's because they're so bloody busy. There's so much going on. Yeah. There's no time. Yeah. Can you tease anything about season six or is that completely off limits? (laughs) Oh God. I mean, they, they do make it so hard for us because they want it to be, you know, they don't want us to tell anything, but I'm like, but it's already out there in a book. Um, Yep. You know, we we do have a new family. I think everybody knows that. We do have a new family come to the Ridge called the Christies. And they definitely, there's a lot of upheaval from their arrival. Mm -hmm. I'll give that. Uh That's great. That's about all I can say. (laughs) Totally, totally. (laughs) Um, I have to ask you about Belfast. And I have to ask you about, Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it's even in comparison to a long form, again, Claire, Every process is so different. How did you get involved with Belfast? And I got to ask you about how personal it is. I don't want to get, we don't get too personal on this podcast, but 
There must be personal history from Kenneth Branagh that overlaps with yours, correct? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because the film is so obviously Ken's personal story, but, Mm -hmm. you know, I have been looking for something to do in Ireland for so many years. Ah. And, you know, even though this ended up not shooting in Ireland, even though I thought it was going to, (laughs) yeah, it's, it's obviously such an Irish story and it's so many Irish actors that it, it definitely rang, it touched me in a way that other, I think projects haven't before. And, you know, I feel like, I feel like there's, you know, there's a lot of, I I thought about my mom a lot when I was making this film. I thought about home a lot when I was making this film, you know, the, the background of the troubles, you know, there's a part at the end of this movie, I don't really want to give it away, but there's three lines that Ken has written that show on the screen of this film Mm -hmm. that absolutely break my heart. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because as an Irish person, you know, the tragedy of what happened in my country and is still sort of happening and, Mm. you know, how much it has affected everybody. I mean, it is my family's life was affected by the trajectory, by the by the troubles in the fact that, you know, we moved to to the border because my dad was a Garda sergeant. Um, You know, I growing up as a kid, we used to shop in the north because it was just across the border and like the currencies were stronger, you know, mm. for us to go over. So we would go shopping there. So you would go through army checkpoints all the time. And, wow. you know, it's all of this stuff. And and I think, yeah, when I read this script, I just was like, this is just such a beautiful script. And it's also, I don't know, it says more about the people of Northern Ireland focusing on this one family and like really just telling this little boy's story tells me more about the tragedy of what happened in the North than any film that sort of ends up glamorizing the violence by looking at it from the perspective of the ideology, you know? Such a great point. Yeah. And it's, that's fascinating what you just said, considering your characters don't have names (laughs) in that way. It's universal. But as you're saying, by narrowing in on one family, this gives faces to this moment in history. I love the point about glamorizing violence because I really feel this film does not is not interested in no, glamorizing the violence at all. Not at all. And the ideologies behind it, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that that's what's so beautiful about it. It's just, it, you know, I think Ken is able to just illuminate like how just destructive and pointless these ideologies are, yeah. you know, where so many people end up spending so much time you know, lauding them and and giving them so much weight, and it's like no, it it they're meaningless in the end of the day because they ruin lives. Yeah, Did, was were you and the rest of the cast? You all have roots in Ireland, so was the script fully written and then cast, and then did you guys discuss all of your personal history? Yeah, no, Ken Ken wrote that. I mean, while everybody in the else in the world was baking banana bread, Ken oh. was writing this amazing script. <laughs> he only started writing it in March of the lockdown. Really? And then we started okay. filming in July, August. I mean, you know, the man is a genius. So the script is written, I think, I don't know. I think, you know, I was one of the last of the um, core crew, the core cast to come along, to come onto the film. So yeah, the, the script is fully formed when when I got sent it. Um, But one thing Ken did, which was really amazing as an actor, and, you know, I think it's because he probably is an actor and he's just so smart at knowing what makes actors tick and how to get them to do what he wants without making it seem obvious, is he, Uh. the first day... Um, we all got to the location. Um, we had a few days of sort of rehearsals and fittings and everything. So the first day he had Judy Dench, Kieran Hines, Jamie Dornan and myself. We all sat in a room with Ken mm. and he just had us all talking and he would ask us questions about our childhoods, about our parents, about their parenting styles, about our wow. grandparents. Um, and he would pose these scenarios and these questions you know and even you know about ourselves like how would we react to a certain thing or how would we you know if if this happened what what do you think your parents would have done and wow. and so very cleverly he was getting us to sort of think about what was in the script and 
you know, bringing things from our own life into these characters um, without it seeming like he was giving us these clear directions. He's just, I mean, the man's a genius. Like he's just very good at pulling strings and just not seeming like he's doing it at all. But what it also did was because, you know, none of us had really met before worked with each other. I mean, I had met Kieran before, but we'd never worked together. We all just got to know each other really quickly. Mm-hmm. And, you know, barriers are kind of down and, and you you form a bond because you know all these lovely things about people's childhood and their parents. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's so clever. That is really fascinating. That, And I, I think that anyone who sees this film instinctively understands that many of those conversations must have must have happened because it's such a fascinating example of specific yet universal this is a very particular family but again partly because they are not given character names they're also Mm -hmm. able we are able to project ourselves from any culture like onto this family i think well that's i mean it's great to hear that because you know when you're making it i mean we all felt it was really special, but because it felt really personal to us. And, you know, I think there's such a through line of, you know, Irish mothers and and the way that they react Mm -hmm. to things. You know, I felt that I recognized Ma, but you never really know if that's Mm going to resonate beyond the borders of this country or the UK or whatever. So um, I'm glad you, you, you did. (laughs) Totally. Well, and the other element, I mean, the other thing that I think ties it into the universality is the chitty chitty bang bang, the the stage mm. plays. I mean, these beautiful color uh, depictions of cinema or stage. Did where does that factor into the construction of the character? Did you have your own chitty chitty bang bang growing up that then informs that element of like cinema? Like this is a movie about cinema too. Yeah, well, it was the escapism of cinema, right? Mm-hmm. You know, that's the. Oh yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, kid I used to I used to suffer from migraines when I was a kid but I also sometimes used to fake them so I could stay home from school (laughs) and and part of it would be when I when I genuinely had them you know I'd have to lie in a dark room for a couple of hours but then when I would get better I could go downstairs and I could lie on the couch and watch tv and so because it was like daytime weird tv there was all of these like 1940s black and white movies that would be on. And so that was my Perfect. escapism into these films. I used to love them so much. But yeah, I mean, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang was on. I mean, you okay. you can't grow up in the UK or Ireland. It's on every Christmas. It's okay. like one of the staple films. I don't know, weirdly, there's a couple of films that are always just played at Christmas time. And um, that was a huge one when I was a kid. I mean, they would just play every year. So... I think all of us, the only person who hadn't seen it, I think was Judy Dench. Oh. Um, Cause Jamie had asked her and she was like, oh no, no, no. She doesn't, she doesn't go to the cinema. So we were she like, doesn't. what? No, she has no interest in film watching oh. it. She's a theater lady through uh, and through. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Cause that's just such a fascinating, that is a through line connecting us to these characters, to that time period, to Kenneth, like all of that. It's just yeah. great. Can I ask about charitable causes and just causes in general that you support. I want to get bigger picture here because um, I know that you're as much an advocate as you are an artist. And I think that certain listeners of this podcast would be curious to know how to blend the two. And if you're willing, I'd love to ask about the crew strike issues that are happening right now. Well, I'm not in the States a lot recently, but I, you know, I, one of my best friends is in costume in the States and we were talking about this last week. And I think it's important that we have unions. I mean, it's, it's very strange that the difference between the UK and the U S I mean, obviously I started working in the U S and getting into SAG was such a big thing. Mm. And then you come to the UK and equity is such, has got such less teeth and Beck oh. too is, I guess, the um, equivalent of Yahtzee in gotcha. the UK. And and for crews in the UK, the, the unions are really terrible. But I think, you know, what was what I was talking to my my uh, friend about with with the Yahtzee strike is that strikes are important and they're necessary. I mean, we the the, the hours that crews work. I mean, crews 
around the globe just get treated terribly, I think, in a lot of instances. You know, you can't work a 17, 18 hour day, sometimes longer, then be expected to drive home, get up four hours, five hours later, and then drive back in and be safe and work at the same again. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. I mean, I think that's what they're all asking for is just safe working conditions. And that is not, you know, I remember working on certain things and my driver would say that he'd only had three hours sleep. Yeah. And you're like, mm, A, that's not good for your health and you shouldn't be doing that. But B, I don't feel very safe being driven on a motorway by someone Absolutely. who's only had three hours sleep and then is doing that five days consecutively. But it's also the problem is, you know, I know some of the unions or some of the the, the groups within the unions have strike funds. So when mm. their members strike, they don't go without a paycheck. But then mm. I know other groups like costume, hair, makeup and stuff, they don't have strike funds. And if okay. you strike, you know, you don't get uh, unemployment. So what do families do? What do, what do crews do when they have a family and they have to support people? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's a tough situation. I don't really know what, you know, what else to say about all of that. Totally. It's just, I feel for them and I, I support them a hundred percent, but it's a really tough situation. Yeah, I think it really is just about uh, describing exactly what you just described and recognizing that it's a tough situation, like just at least having the conversation or in terms of the question of what can individual people do to combat this system, the first step is talking about the system and the ways that it's not working, right? Yeah, and I think, you know, I think I'm in a position on my show where I can advocate for our crew, and I do. Hmm. And I think that's, something you know i think a lot of the time as an actor you feel like you don't have a voice within a production but if you are i guess you know it's hard if you're kind of coming in for a week or a couple of days or something like that but i think if you definitely if you're a regular on a show or you're a lead or something like that then i think it's your responsibility to also advocate for your crew you know i think we wouldn't we would be nothing without our crews. And I think, you know, you that's something I take very seriously. Absolutely. And it just seems to me like, would you agree that it's at any point in an actor's career, even before they're the series regular, that it is okay or it should be encouraged to speak up when you see something that is not right? <laughs> yeah, 100%. I mean, but I understand why people might not feel like they can. Right. Because I do think, you know, there's, you know, your job is so precarious a lot of the time. And, you know, when you're starting out and you've got four days on something or, you know, you're damn lucky that you've got those four days and it feels like Absolutely. you don't want to rock the boat, which I completely understand. But I do think that there's a way, if you see something for sure, of being able to speak up in a in a way that, you're not sort of causing trouble, but you're just saying, look, like I, you know, is this, I don't know if this is okay over here. I've noticed something, you know, Yeah. and there's always usually a second AD is a good person to usually go to because they are always, okay. you know, a great liaison between cast and producers and stuff like that. And, gotcha. and they can always steer you to the right person to speak to usually. That's great. That's great. These are great tips. Thank you for going there with me because I feel like, it's something that we, anyone who has a platform and is in the, in this industry should be talking about it at the very least, talking yeah. about it. So <laughs> thank you. Um, we ask these questions. Okay, so I have to ask you the nerdiest actor questions. You mentioned the SAG, getting into SAG. What was the job that got you the, your SAG card? Oh, I actually think it was commercials. Okay. I think that's what... I was doing when I first came to LA, I, mm -hmm. I needed some money and I needed some to get my SAG card. So I was doing some commercials and I think I had, I, there was two that I got that were like speaking commercials. And oh. I think that's how I, I, one was for a telecom something. I can't even remember. I, feel like I know I did telecom. one with Constance Wu. Oh, Constance Wu and I did one for Target. I remember that. It's so the people you meet along the way in commercials don't knock them. Honestly, oh, they they that's really cool. They they paved the way for a lot of things. Totally, <laughs> and then it becomes the speaking roles and the the TV shows and all of that from there. Yeah, 
and yeah. some non-speaking roles too. That I have all of those in my <laughs> my resume. <laughs> Your feet in Devil Wears Prada. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give to that era, Katrina? If you could go back in time, is there anything you wish you'd known? Oh God, I think I would have. I don't know, God. I mean, there's there was there was Probably a there was a lot of thing. dark. Well, you know, you, everything makes you who you are. You know, the bad days, the good days, it sort of brings you to the right point in time eventually, right? Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, I used to. I used to take it so personally when I wouldn't get stuff in the beginning, you know, it was like that I wasn't good enough, you know, that that's mm -hmm. the reason it, I didn't get the job that I, I didn't do a good enough audition. Um, I wasn't good at what I was doing. And I think, you know, having now sat on the other side of things and I've watched people audition and I've, it's, you know, nine times out of 10, it's about, a sense of who you are, you know, it's not about what you're doing. Like I've seen great actors in the room and they've given great auditions, but they just don't feel like the character. Mm -hmm. And it's as annoying sometimes and as arbitrary as that. And it's really not about you. And it's not that you're not good enough. And I, I wish that I had known that earlier. Sure. So I wouldn't have beaten myself up so much. <laughs> totally. Um, yeah, I think it would be great if all actors could sit in an audition process yes. on the other side. It would be such a great thing. Earlier on, maybe, in their careers. Yeah. that's a, yeah. It's really true. Like, once you're on the other side of the table, that's when you have all these epiphanies about how it works. And I, I think, you know, I know a lot of, a lot of people, you know, you know, a lot of actors, when you're starting off in, in L.A. and stuff, they get these other jobs and... I know some people get jobs as a reader for casting directors, mm. which I think if you can do that, if you can find a way to worm your way into that position, yeah. that is like golden because you see so much. That's great. And I think it can only help you as an actor. That's great advice. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, we asked this of everyone and it's the, it's, I'm totally putting you on the spot. What is one performance that you think every actor should see and study and why? Film, TV, oh God. theater, maybe something I know, you've seen recently. I could give you a few, but uh, anything that Jenna Rollins has done. Okay. So opening night, <laughs> A Woman Under the Influence, mm -hmm. um, Gloria, any of those. I just think she's incredible. Or um, what else would I say? Glenda Jackson in Sunday Bloody Sunday. That's another one. Or <laughs> I could keep going. Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah. looking for Mr. Goodbar, Diane Keaton, like oh, uh -huh. incredible. Oh, cool. Like that, that film, she's incredible in it. Uh, she's also incredible in <laughs> interiors, you know, that, uh, um, Woody Allen film. She has yeah. a scene in the beginning of it. I think it's interiors. I think it's that one where she sits in a, in a psychiatrist chair and she has this monologue and it's, it's incredible. She's incredible. Wonderful. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Do you so do you study in exact detail these performances, or do you just watch them over and over? Or I don't think you can study because I think <laughs> if you tried to like emulate it, or yeah. you'd you'd fail. It's just something innately unique that they do. I mean, like Glenn um, Jenna Rollins is so her own thing, and there's certain things about her that are just so unique, and she yeah. like. I think that's the thing you 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 just have to know I guess it's it's allow yourself the freedom to just do things that are just unique to you that mm -hmm. you can let the character channel through you if that makes sense I mean you have yes. to be sort of so yourself but so not yourself if that makes sense yeah. um it's sort of like a subliminal I mean? inspiration to watch somebody be to really I love this idea of like digging into what really makes you unique because like Kieran Culkin in Succession. Nobody oh else would do the little quirks that he does. What a fabulous but example. But that's what makes like that's what makes that role so unique and so brilliant. And you know, I could watch him all day on that show. Like it's so good. Totally. So the point is not to to, as you say, emulate. You're not copy pasting because that would be impossible, especially for these individual quirks. 
It's more like you are inspired to find your own individual quirks and how to channel that. Yes, but while you're while your characters, you know, while you've done all your work and you've done all your preparation and you've let all of these things in the character sort of sit within you, then you just have to be free and, and not be worried about you know, being your weird self, I guess, (laughs) if that makes sense. It absolutely does. Yes, that's pure gold. Um, I have to say, Jenna Rollins, for whatever reason, has become one of the most frequent responses to that question. Oh, really? I mean, because she's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I started watching her stuff when I was living in New York and trying to make the decision about whether I was going back to acting. And I, I, sort of got turned in, you know, turned on into Cassavetes and I'd gotten all of his mm-hmm. movies and I just was obsessed with her. And it was just such a, like, I don't know what it is. Like what well, it's, it's, she's an inspiration, but it's like, I don't know whether, mm-hmm. cause I, it's not like you think you can do that, but it's definitely like, Oh, I want, I want the chance to at least try, you know? Yeah. It's not necessarily that we can see the DNA of Jenna Rollins in your performances, but we can see, I guess I keep coming back to inspiration. And then there's also confidence. Yeah, it's just inspiration. Right? Yeah. I mean, I think being an actor is 100% about confidence. <laughs> sure. You know, there's nothing worse than somebody trying to undermine your confidence when you're doing something. Because if you lose that, you're mm. you're gone. <laughs> I don't know. And it's such, a, it's such an elusive thing because how do you get it without... I think most of the time it comes with just practice, not practice, but getting to do the job and... Um, you know, it's, I, I'll always say the most difficult job on any show or film is the person who has to come in for a day because yeah. that is the mm. hardest thing because you don't have the luxury of getting comfortable on a set, getting to know the people around you so that when you go to do your work, you're not thrown by all of these things, but coming in for one day, everything's so new and you don't have that comfortability to just allow yourself the freedom to sort of just focus on your work. So yeah, yeah, the confidence is a tough one, but it's the essential one. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Thank you so much, Katrina. This is all so great. Can I ask you one last question? Of course, we touched on auditions, but we always make people relive their traumas. Do you have a worst audition horror story? I've got so many. I mean, (laughs) oh, I have one. Yes, I have one. I I was auditioning for a film with a with a casting director who I'd never auditioned for before. And I was also having, a, I think I was going through a breakup, so I might have not been in the best place. Sure. When, but I, I thought I was really, I don't know, it was this, I mean, it was this role where I was having an argument with a, a, a I think it was a boyfriend in the thing and, Anyway, I was sobbing and I was in tears doing it. And I thought I was all giving it to the character. And I, I, you know, I thought I might have been a little bit overboard, but I thought I was sort of in the right zone. And this casting director was like, OK, thank you. Asked me to do something else. And I, I thought I was doing it OK. But I left and I got a call from my manager and she had called him and like eviscerated me. Like basically was like, I don't know what she was doing. Like, what was that accent? What was going on with her? Yeah. Oh, it was horrible. <laughs> and then, and then that, uh, and then that manager dropped me about two weeks later. So there no. you go. That was my horror story. Yeah. But you know, he obviously wasn't worth it. <laughs> no. <laughs> right in the middle of pilot season too. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah. I wish that. So there you go. Like- everyone who's. Absolutely. Yeah. Those stories these, are, the, these things can, are not atypical. Yeah. They happen. Yeah. People can be really mean. You know, she, she could have told me in the room I wasn't doing what she wanted. But no, she's right. like, oh, okay, great, great. And then behind yeah. your back. Yeah. It's a tough industry. Thank you for all of the advice you gave. That <laughs> and on really, that note. <laughs> on that note, exactly. I think that, no, it's true. Like, this was a great mix of idealistic and realistic advice about the industry. So thank you. Okay, good. I hope so. I hope somebody out there is listening is that I've not ruined their their dream of getting into the business. But anyway. Sure. Well, Katrina, thank you so much and congratulations on Belfast. I'm so excited to have the rest of the world see it. Yeah, I'm excited for everyone to see it too. And thank you so much for having me. In the 
Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.